I'm going to take you through the advances that they made because a lot of people know the end story but don't know much about the path along the way. They tell me that that's the most reproduced photograph uh, ever taken. I'm only repeating what people tell me. It was taken on Wilbur's glass plate camera <coughs> by a man called John T. Dan, resident <laughs> at uh, Kitty Hall. So he did the job and took the photograph. 10.35 uh, a.m. in the morning, their time. The Wright brothers have played around with flight for a number of years before they really got serious. And it was 1899 that they started to ask some very serious questions about aviation. They're the two men, <coughs> and not a lot of people know that the original Wright flyer was in fact a push bike. They worked in their shop, and you must remember in those days that Push bikes were a breakthrough in technology. People had started to give away the horse and were moving into another means of transport. And just as we live in the e-commerce today, uh, these people were coming into the bicycle commerce. They employed a number of people in their shop. They were good technicians at their job. They manufactured bikes and components, and they sold many bikes, and they were comfortably off. They wrote to the Smithsonian Institute and other people to try and gather information and find out where other people had got with their gliders to try and learn from others. It was one day in 19, uh, 1899 that a customer came in and ordered a tube for his bike. <clears throat> he took the tube out of the box and was handling it and examining it closely when Wilbur picked up the box and rotated it as in the diet, uh, photograph there, and he thought, wow, that could be the principle of wing warping to control our kites, which they hadn't had much success with. And so that was the breakthrough that came over the counter at the bike shop. That's how they attached various uh, handles to the device to make it uh, controllable. And so within weeks of looking at that uh, cardboard box, <coughs> Wilbur had conduct, uh, constructed a two metre uh, glider. It became the world's first glider with lateral and pitch control, longitudinal control. And so then they decided to get a bit more serious and they contacted the US Bureau of Meteorology and said where can we find steady winds because we need steady winds to, uh, for our gliding experiments. And they came back and said Kitty Hawk has the best winds that we know of good steady winds and the terrain there should suit you. So this was over 400 miles from Dayton uh, to Kitty Hawk, but nevertheless off they went. They took their bits and pieces with them. There you can see two main spars. They expected <coughs> to buy two 19 foot main spars uh, when they reached Kitty Hawk or the towns nearby, uh, but they couldn't so they had to do with a six, uh, two 16 foot pieces of wood and then they constructed their glider with quite a few modifications. It was really a kite which was going to become a glider. That's what it looked like. <coughs> the canard out the front <coughs> was going to be a, at the nose of the pilot who would lay prone in the central section. Wing warping would control uh, the, uh, the roll on the aircraft two handles would control the canard in the front full pitch. So they weren't people to move ahead quickly, <coughs> they experimented, <coughs> but they found it very difficult to handle and they discovered also that they had the wrong wing camber. They'd taken uh, information from other people and particularly from Otto Lilienthal in Germany who'd killed himself a few years before, 1896. <coughs> Um, and uh, they discovered that the wing section wasn't anywhere near what uh, they hoped for. But by the end of their time, uh, they had flown it for lengthy periods. In a moment of inattention, it got out of hand and crashed, but they got it together again, and away they went. And as it says there, <coughs> on occasions they flew it for about 60 metres, but it was definitely a bit of a pig or a dog they didn't like it very much at all. So, <clears throat> taking the technical data which they got from other people, uh, they built a wind tunnel. <clears throat> and in that wind 
tunnel. They did a lot of aerofoil uh, section testing and uh, came up with a far better <coughs> design than what they'd been using up to that time. So there was their bigger, brand new glider for 1901. <coughs> and the changed camber improved the handling dramatically. As far as I can understand, the pitch control on the canard at the front was controlled by two handles, and the, uh, the roll or the wing warping was controlled by the feet. Once again, testing the mechanism <coughs> before they got on board. Their testing went as far as static tests like so, in the steady wind with people holding onto it and checking the pitch uh, and uh, roll before they advance even further. But you can imagine the next move was for the two people to let go of the glider and they would glide down the slope. And of course, this is all taking place in 1901. There they are, in the glider, free flight with lateral control and pitch control. No one in the world had a glider anywhere near as sophisticated as this. They flew considerable distances on many occasions and became experts at it. Still in 1901, Wilver uh, demonstrates the position of the pilot, etc. So 1902, they decided that they would change things a little bit, and this is where they added a tailplane. It was non-steerable, non-movable, and it didn't solve all of their problems, but they were having problems with uh, adverse yaw, which is uh, yaw because of the wing warping, so they thought the tail would help. So with the rudder added, it improved a little bit, but they changed the wing warp into a hip cradle, where by moving the hips from side to side, they would control the wing warp. Again, it was thoroughly tested before they actually got on board. And here they are soaring over the dunes in it, 1902. And you can see that they didn't just go to Kitty Hawk in 1903 and fly an aeroplane and come home. There was a lot of work went on before that. The handling was much improved and you can see there's a single rudder on that uh, model there. And so while things had got better, they still weren't anywhere near perfect. But they sent a telegram home saying that they'd beaten all records for flatness of glide, that they reckon they'd glided further than anyone else in the world. And by the time they left Kitty Hawk in 1902, they had over a thousand glides in their machine. So they weren't amateurs by any manner of means. In fact, they'd become the most experienced flyers in the world, and still not many people knew about it, although Hiram Maxim and other people were starting to tea leave on their, get in on their developments. Hiram Maxim and his friends and staff were visiting them at Kitty Hawk on occasions and going away and saying, we won't tell anyone what you've been up to, but they certainly did and they discussed what the Wright brothers were up to. So they felt they were being betrayed a little bit by some of the people that had taken an interest in their progress. Anyway, they left Kitty Hawk that year saying the next move is to put a motor onto our glider. So in 1903, they developed a new glider, a new aircraft. They had to develop their own petrol engine. They contacted quite a number of uh, producers of petrol motors and uh, they weren't suitable, they were too heavy or underpowered. And so they had someone on staff, Charles Taylor, uh, who elected to build that engine for them. He actually built two. And uh, the first one was a test engine, the second one was the one they used in the aircraft. They already had a petrol engine uh, in, on their premises which ran a lathe 
uh, so they can produce bike parts. You can imagine how much time this took as well. Uh, they're trying to make bikes and sell bikes and run a business, and then they're going 450 miles to Giddy Org every year uh, with a new device, a new aircraft. So it wasn't uh, all plain sailing, just sitting down waiting for things to happen, no, making it work. So what they actually achieved <coughs> in this case was uh, to what they had before, a new aircraft plus an engine, plus they had to design the propellers because uh, propellers for aircraft weren't bought off the shop. They had to think about them and design them yourself. So they took two pieces of solid wood and planed them up into two propellers. They were forward thinking and uh, had them as a contra-rotating pair. <coughs> That didn't occur in twin engine aircraft in general form until about 1938, so they were ages ahead of their time. And they knew that this new aircraft, which all up weighed over 700 pounds, wasn't going to be able to launch like um, the other uh, gliders beforehand. They're going to have to develop a track. So they built a 60 foot track for the aircraft to travel along so that it could become airborne. This new machine had a wingspan of 40 feet and 4 inches, uh, double what they had two years before. So there it is, <coughs> they built two sheds at Kitty Hawk and uh, they had intended, they used to leave the previous glider in the shed and uh, practice with it and go over what they'd done before they used the new glider. And so they intended to use the 1902 glider for a bit of practice to um, go back over the theory and practice that they developed beforehand, but they ran out of time. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> they uh, really had to abandon some of the ideas that they had. And then eventually uh, they started static testing with their new glider. They certainly did have problems. That's Wilbur demonstrating uh, the craft on the 14th, but before that, before the 14th of December, they had problems in this area here, where with a rough running engine, <coughs> the props had to jerk backwards and forwards and put a strain on the whole device. And so a weakness showed up there, and they had to send um, a bloke called Spratt, who was from the opposition, who happened to be there, if not spying on them, taking a genuine interest in their advances. He was uh, a good friend of um, someone else who was trying to develop an aeroplane as well. Anyway, he went and got some new parts uh, built for that at a nearby area, nearby town. They put them on, they weren't satisfactory. And so Orville went back to um, Dayton, Ohio, constructed new parts and brought them back. By this time, they were becoming desperate the year was going on, the weather was getting colder and colder. Uh, in fact, the puddles of water were turning to ice. They um, had competition from Samuel Langley, who was uh, attempting to fly with government support, and uh, he'd already made one attempt, which had failed at this stage, and the papers were saying he's ready for another one. And they expected that he might be successful get the headlines before them. So on the 14th they had to abandon their, their uh, attempt because of the, the wind, which wasn't favourable. But then <clears throat> on December the 17th it all came together. The wind was right and it was really pretty well the last chance that they had before they had to give it away and go back to Dayton because of the weather, the wind and the cold. And so that's Orville <coughs> making the first attempt with their new aircraft. Remember the no high speed taxi trials? Just get into it and fly it. So that's all. <coughs> that photograph was taken at the beginning of that run. He flew 120 feet in 12 seconds. Mm -hmm. Orville drew the straw, the long straw. Wilbur drew the, short, drew the short straw and had to fly second. He flew a little bit longer, a little bit further. And then it was Orville's turn again. <coughs> risking the aircraft at any, at any time it could have 
failed or hit the ground and damaged, become damaged. But then again, another successful flight, 200 feet in 15 seconds. And by this time, uh, Wilbur had analysed all that uh, had gone before and he got into the, the craft and off he went. There's a bit of debate whether it was 57 or 59 seconds. And so they felt that they achieved what they wanted to. Add all this up, you'll see that they left Kitty Hawk with 97 seconds of flying experience between the two of them. Not a lot. They sent a telegram, a historic telegram home, saying that they'd been successful. And uh, that was uh, to let the press know uh, that they'd achieved success. At the end of the fourth flight, uh, Wilbur damaged the, the craft. They took it back to the hangar and uh, a gust of wind caught it and blew it over and uh, it never flew again. They went back to Dayton and they set themselves up at a place called Huffman Prairie. But they developed this idea of a drop weight <coughs> which would, if they wound the weight up to the top and then dropped it and the rope was attached to the uh, aircraft, the aircraft would accelerate according to the dropped weight and uh, that would help them in their, uh, in their flying, getting launched. So this is where they really learned to fly. As I said, 97 seconds. And they came back here to learn to fly. In 1905, they were climbing and descending. They were flying figures of eight and they were staying in the air for a quite reasonable length of time. They built a number of gliders in 1904. They were flying for over a minute in Huffman Prairie. By 1905, they were flying 30 minutes in the air. And of course, this was a marvellous achievement. No one else in the world had got anywhere near this. They were actually trying to do all this in secret. But as you can see there, a tramway went past Huffman Prairie and uh, people used to gather to see the performance. And of course there they were flying around the, the paddock. A couple of years ago, a few of us went to Oshkosh and we had a bit of time up our sleeve beforehand. We decided to go to the Dayton Air Force Museum, which is one of the best in the world. <laughs> so on the way down there, I said, well, as well as going to Dayton Museum, why don't we go to Huffman Prairie? And <clears throat> the two travelling companions said to me, Huffman Prairie, what's there? And I said, well, this is the home of aviation. This is where aviation grew from. And they said, oh, yeah, I suppose we go and have a look. So we got there. I went goosebumpy <coughs> when we got there. So did he and so did Delia. We realised that we'd come to the home of aviation. And we were so pleased we did. But the other funny thing about it was when we got to Oshkosh, People would say, oh yeah, what have you been up to? And they'd say, oh, we've been to Dayton and we went to Huffman Prairie. And these other people would say, Huffman Prairie, what's there? And they'd say, oh, don't you know about Huffman Prairie? <laughs> oh, yes, well, this is the home of aviation. <laughs> and I used to chuckle in the background as I'm extolling their knowledge. Instant experts. <laughs> Instant experts, yes. Anyway, there they are. They're the men that we owe great debt of gratitude for all the pleasure we've had out of flying. That's them. Thank you very much.